So good evening to everybody again. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm honored and delighted to be here uh, with Father Michael Lapsley from South Africa and with uh, my friend and colleague uh, Sami Awad from Bethlehem. Uh, this next part of the evening we're going to, uh, we're going to do as a conversation. Uh, so uh, Sami and I thought we would, we would, we will begin just by saying a few words about how we came to this whole idea of healing and healing <laughs> hatred. And then uh, we will let Father Michael uh, introduce himself and talk about his words, uh, his work. Uh, I started thinking about uh, healing hatred. I was, uh, I don't know, Yitzhak <coughs> can maybe remind me, uh, Yitzhak Mendelssohn, uh, who's here with us and will be speaking tomorrow. No, no. 2000, was it? No, I think it was a bit after that. It was during the Second Intifada. At the beginning of the, I think it was later on. Anyway. You always argue about dates and stuff the Yeah, we can't even agree on that date. Uh, so, uh, and I was, it, it was in the context of the Second Intifada that we talked about the fact that, that uh, you can get help to, to uh, victims of, of uh, terror attacks could be assisted, obviously, with their physical uh, injuries, uh, and to some extent with their psychological injuries so that they could get back to so-called normal functioning. But hating the people who had done this to you and the hatred, that's part of your normal functioning. That's not something that we need to heal. And I started thinking about what it's doing to us as a society that we don't heal the hatred. Because if we're all going to uh, uh, simply carry this hatred and this anger and this bitterness around with us, what's going to happen to us? Uh, so that's when I started thinking about healing hatred and uh, with the feeling that the regular tools of interfaith dialogue weren't helping. They didn't seem to be uh, uh, doing what we needed them to do uh, and, and the interfaith dialogue wasn't creating the results we needed and we needed to look for different tools. So I'll talk a little bit more about that work tomorrow, but uh, for now, that's, that's the story of how I started thinking about this, this idea of healing hatred. Sam. Uh, for me, um, the organization I started in 1998 called Holy Land Trust, we started out as a peace organization during the Oslo peace process. Our idea was how can we strengthen the peace process by having more people and communities begin to engage in the work uh, of peacemaking at a time when we were noticing a lot of work happening at the top level between politicians. And that at the ground level there was a feeling that there was actually more separation and segregation happening between Palestinians and Israelis during the peace process than even before the peace process began. Uh, but the second intifada came and as an organization, we shifted our work to, as I mentioned before, nonviolent activism, resistance. We saw the peace process fail, we saw Oslo fail, and, and the notion of that uh, independent Palestinian state, which is what we as Palestinians we're told from our youngest of age, this is what we strive for, became something that we as civil society need to engage in. And so, as an organization, we began to lead a lot of the nonviolent activities that were happening against the occupation, against the system of occupation, the structures, uh, checkpoints, roadblocks, settlements, settlers. This was a lot of where we were motivated in the work we were doing. Uh, but a at a certain point uh, in our work, we, we began to ask uh, questions. Uh, and, and, and noticing the, the level of hatred and animosity that was growing, it wasn't just about a political struggle, it wasn't just about a need for security. There was something much deeper that needed to be addressed. And, and that's when this notion of 
beginning to understand even who the enemy is. What motivates the enemy to, to behave the way they behave towards me as a Palestinian. And this, this obsession with security, uh, this, this need, where, where does this come from? Uh, for us as Palestinians, this desperation for a state, where does this come from as well? And, and for me, the turning point in my life happened, and, and this is where like, the work of Dr. Dejan becomes so important for me, is, is when I went uh, and visited Auschwitz. I went on a retreat called the Bearing Witness Retreat. Uh, and, and for me, in all honesty, I say, I, and uh, this, I share this as my personal story, I discovered my enemy in the death camps of Auschwitz and Bergenau. In a, in a sense, I discovered the narrative, the story that I as a Palestinian was never told. The story of fear, the story of insecurity, the story of a continuous, uh, continuous episode after episode after episode of hundreds of years of the Jewish community feeling isolated, discriminated, marginalized, uh, put into ghettos, violated, and coming out of the greatest experience of that trauma was the Holocaust and everything that came after that Holocaust. So the need for security, the need for protecting ourselves, the need to never trust anybody again because when we trusted, look what happened to us. In a sense, the fear that became what I would see as a key motivation in how Israeli Jewish society functions even until this day. In Auschwitz, I heard something that shocked me. Uh, we're talking about education and, uh, and teaching. I heard Israeli teachers tell Israeli children there that if the Palestinians have an opportunity, they'll do to you what the Nazis did to your ancestors. I was a future SS soldier who was going to commit a Holocaust to these kids. And then for me, I came back from that experience completely shocked where I said, yes, Palestinian rights are important and ending occupation is important and creating that peace is important. But for me, the foundation of healing uh, of this fear that exists and the hatred that exists between us is key. How can you actually make peace when you don't have good neighbors ready to live next to each other? Neighbors that even are ready to recognize each other. And then for me, I started realizing that even that whole Oslo peace process that many of us supported, many of you may have actively been involved in, was another process that was also motivated by fear of the other. I am afraid of you, therefore I'm going to try to make a deal with you that you don't kill me or hate me or the existential threat that both communities suffer from until uh, this day. And so for us and our work, uh, this has become very important to look into the collective traumas that face us as Palestinians and Israelis. Not just the individual trauma that we continue to suffer from, but the historic stories and narratives that we have inherited and keep repeating and speaking about the other. And, and joining this program was key because uh, until we, we created this work together, I didn't know how to do it. <laughs> I mean, I could talk about, yes, we should not be afraid, and then we should deal with the issue of hatred and fear. But then we started, and, and Sarah will explain more about this later, the, the tools of how we are learning and engaging in this work. And the tools are ones that we're learning uh, from our experiences, from our culture, from our religions, and of course, learning from the experiences of other people who deal directly with the issue of hatred and fear of their communities. And this is why for us, having Father Michael Lapsley in this gathering is key and very important for us. And, and we'd love for you to begin by sharing your story and the work that you are doing now. Thank you for the uh, opportunity to be here. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sami. Um, it is uh, a very special uh, privilege and responsibility um, to come here. I, I like to describe myself as uh, a New Zealand-born South African. Um, and that's important to say because I was formed in a different world than the world 
called apartheid. Um, and I, I, I came to uh, South Africa as a, a young, freshly ordained priest. I'm a member of an Anglican religious order. I'm, I'm with the brother of my order, Society of the Sacred Mission. My order said to me, after I was ordained as a priest in Australia, what would you like to do next? I said, I'd like to go to Japan. They said, that's great, we'll send you to South Africa. <laughs> and that was the beginning of another journey. But I often say that the day I arrived in South Africa, I stopped being a human being and became a white man. Because suddenly, every single aspect of my life uh, was decided by the color of my skin. Everything from where I live, from the bathroom I could use, the part of the sea I could swim in, everything was defined uh, by color. So for me, whiteness became like leprosy. I thought maybe like Lady Macbeth, if I washed often enough, that maybe the whiteness would come off. Um, so I joined the liberation struggle in South Africa, not as a favor to black people, but as a way that I could recover my own humanity. Uh, in solidarity uh, with people of color uh, struggling for their own basic uh, human rights. So I was, uh, at the time of the Soweto uprising, I became the national chaplain of Anglican students um, when children began to be shot in our streets. Um, and, and, and for me as a Christian, perhaps the most traumatic thing to realize was that those who shot children uh, read the Bible every day and went to church on Sunday and shot children. Um, and I had been, unusually as an Anglican, I was a committed pacifist. Um, you don't meet many Anglicans and Catholics. Anglicans and Catholics compete with each other to work out which wars they can bless. Um, but, uh, but I was a, a committed pacifist. Um, and the shooting of children brought me in that context to the reluctant conclusion that uh, people had a right to defend themselves. Um, so I became a conventional Anglican uh, once more. Um, so I was expelled from South Africa. Uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu had just become the bishop in Lesotho, a small African country, uh, <coughs> surrounded by South Africa, where my brother Chepo comes from. Um, and uh, I, so I went to live in Lesotho. Uh, Archbishop Tutu says I was the most difficult priest he ever had. Um, but he still later became a lifelong friend. Um, I was part of the liberation movement. I was a priest, a chaplain, a pastor within the African National Congress of South Africa, the organization of Nelson Mandela. Um, now I just want to make a little a bracket about the armed struggle in South Africa. People of South Africa spent nearly 50 years struggling non-violently before they picked up arms. Um, the, uh, in other countries, they wait just a few months before they pick up the arms. Um, so because of the pressure of the whole world, I mean, in our context, um, it's important to say that the apartheid regime didn't see the Lord on the road to Damascus. Uh, they responded to the pressure of the world, uh, the pressure of the, of the people in South Africa and the pressure of the world. Uh, and so eventually they said they'll negotiate. But when they said they would negotiate, they didn't stop killing. In our period of negotiations, we lost thousands of lives. Um, and so three months after Nelson Mandela was released from prison, I received a letter bomb in the post. Um, hidden inside the pages of two religious magazines. Um, and so that was how I lost both my hands and eye, my eardrums were shattered. In terms of my faith, I had a sense that God was with me. Uh, God had said, it's a bomb, don't open it. I opened it, the bomb went off. But I felt the presence of God with me. Um, and in the days following, um, first I felt that God was with me, but I also I knew the regime had got me. I also knew instantly that I had won and they had lost. Because it was a bomb that was supposed to kill. And I was alive. So for me, the journey was a journey of appropriating that victory. Um, 
but also I had excellent healthcare, first in Zimbabwe, then in two Australian hospitals. But it was the prayer, the love, and the support of people around the world. Uh, people of faith, of all faiths, and people of goodwill that helped me make my bombing redemptive, to bring life out of death, good out of evil. And I realized that if I was filled with hatred, bitterness, self-pity, a desire for revenge, that I would be a victim forever. They would have failed to kill the body, but they would have killed the soul. So I would say my journey is a journey from being a victim. Obviously, I was a victim. I was a, a survivor because I was alive. But I, I'd taken another step, the step of victory, not in a militaristic sense, but in the sense of taking back agency. And I returned to South Africa, having been away for 16 years, and I discovered a damaged nation a nation damaged in our humanity, damaged by what we've done, by what have been done to us, and by what we failed to do. And all of us for a, for a story to tell. Now in my case, my story had been acknowledged, reverenced, recognized by people all over the world. But for millions of South Africans, that was not true. All they had was their victimhood to distinguish themselves from others. And so I realized that we, of course, we would have to provide water, electricity, education, health care to millions and millions of our people who had not had it. We would also have to deal with the human heart. We'd have to deal with what we had inside of us if we we're going to create a different kind of society. I became chaplain to a trauma center for victims of violence and torture, where I spent five years. And it was there, and you know that we had our own truth and reconciliation uh, commission led by Archbishop Tutu, that created a platform for 23,000 people. But we're a nation of more than 50 million. So my question is, what about the rest of the stories? Uh, and so that led us to develop a methodology that we call the healing of the memories, creating what we like to call safe and sacred spaces where people could deal with what they have inside them. Uh, because of the journey the nation had traveled and how the nation's journey had affected the individual and how the journey of the parents and grandparents and great-grandparents both affected and infected us. Um, so that's a little bit of the, uh, of, 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 of the picture. Incidentally, it's my second time to come here. I came a few months ago for the launch of my uh, memoir in uh, the heavenly language of Arabic. Um, which was about the 12th language that had come out in. We're still waiting to find a Hebrew translator. Uh, but thank you, that's my few words. Thank you, uh, Father Michael. I'm, um, when you talked about, uh, you said something about uh, recovering your own humanity. And um, that resonates powerfully for us in our situation. And I think one of the things that we grapple with is the pain of, of acknowledging or recognizing the narrative of the other because of what it means about our own self-definition. Uh, that, that for me as an Israeli Jew, making space for the Palestinian narrative goes against so much of what I thought about myself, about my people, about my nation, about my purpose in life, about how I understand myself. And that coming to terms is both extremely painful, uh, but also I think gives one a very strong sense of, of recognizing my, you know, of, of not of recognizing, of reclaiming my own humanity, um, but it's it's really painful. So, how do we help people do that? Sammy talks about going to Auschwitz. He heard about Auschwitz. Maybe he'd read some stories, but he went to Auschwitz and was changed. In my experience, people are seldom changed by intellectual argument. Seldom, seldom, seldom. But people are changed 
by experience. And particularly where we meet the, the humanity of the other, what we've learned in our own work is that pain is transcendent. Pain is transcendent. And where we are able to listen to each other's pain reverently and respectfully, we will find across enormous gulfs a connection. But I, but I want to also just emphasize that healing is not a substitute for struggles for justice. And that is very important. And equally, you know, in, in, in South Africa in the 1980s, there were many organizations working for reconciliation. By reconciliation, they meant that black and white would sit together and they would become reconciled. And the white person would go back to the palace and the black person would go back to the ghetto. Uh, and, and that, I don't believe, uh, is... That is where reconciliation becomes an excuse or a substitute for justice. But where, um, interestingly, uh, and my, my Anglican sister will be pleased, you know, in, in South Africa, all the religious organizations split on racial lines, except the Anglicans. And, and I don't know why God was so kind to us, but, but what I want to say was that the, we were there as young, and I was still only a young priest, of, even though I was their chaplain at 24, 25. But we stayed together uh, every year for a week or so. And, and it was the exposure to each other's humanity that changed us and led and changed our lives. So some white kids then refused to go to the South African Army because of their experience of the humanity of their fellow black brothers and sisters. So it, it actually fueled a struggle for justice, but a justice that would have to be inclusive of the humanness of, of all of us. But I think also in our own work, um, we don't set up places for discussion. We set up spaces for talking and for listening. So you don't have to persuade the other person that you haven't understood the correct dates, that you haven't understood what happened, but you have an opportunity to speak, to listen, and to be listened to. Now, many of the words we are saying tonight, uh, we can say them in a few sentences, but this can be the journey of decades, of, of begin, beginning these journeys uh, towards healing. But I want to emphasize, pain shared is transcendent and it can connect us at the most profound level. And I, I work all over the world and I keep going to places where people tell me how unique they are. Uh, well, of course they're unique, but at the deepest, deepest, deepest level, we are one human family capable of doing the most terrible things to each other, but also capable of generosity, kindness, and compassion. So, uh, you talk about pain shared being transcendent, but one of the things that we often see is that pain shared becomes competitive. And, and we get into a cycle of, of competitive suffering, comp competitive victimhood. I share my pain, and then I'm upset that what you want to do is share your pain. Because what I actually want you to do is acknowledge my pain. Um, so, how do we break that cycle? It's interesting. Um, the problem is, Sarah, like you, I know the questions. I don't know any of the answers. <laughs> <laughs> but... but but Israelis and Palestinians, um, I'm sure you must get on very well with the Irish, especially with, with Northern Ireland. Because Northern Ireland specializes 
and competition for victimhood. Uh, there's no pain like our pain. Um, and I think also, as South Africans, we have often felt, as a nation, there's no pain like our pain. But I would just want to perhaps repeat, it's in the talking and the listening, where there's no need to persuade, there's no need to compete. Because I think we have to get to the point where we're able to say, pain is pain is pain. Um, and, and, the, and there is no hierarchy of pain, because you are dealing with what it is that we're capable of. So I think it's often uh, how we set up the rules of the game in terms of the encounter, because if it's set up as a, as a, a even as an intellectual dialogue, then, the, then often you're saying, well, let me make sure that I've marshaled my arguments better than yours, because then I can, because in the end I can defeat you uh, in the argument. But if, if, you see, also, when we're speaking about pain, it's important that we, that we have uh, the language of emotion as well. Um, because the poison lies not in what we think about the past and what we feel about the past. Uh, which is why you can have, uh, I can tell my life story and it will not bring healing. And people often say healing is about storytelling. Well, the reality is that we know well is that storytelling can be precisely what keeps hatred alive. Uh, so, so there has to be a process of letting out and letting go. But I also want to bring another concept that I, I think is part of uh, one, one uh, uh, Palestinian said to me in the last couple of days, um, said, okay, is it Willie Brown who went to Auschwitz uh, and said sorry? And was saying, we're waiting for an Israeli prime minister to come and say, we're sorry about the Nakba. So but the, the point I want to pull out of that, and I think this relates also to my sister's work uh, with, with uh, battered women, women victims of sexual violence, is the importance of acknowledgement. You know, I, w I was uh, in a work healing of memories workshop in um, uh, Hawaii with a, with a group of women who had known uh, violence, gender-based violence, for generations. And at some point, I felt moved to say, I feel guilt and shame as a man for what you have experienced. And this woman began to cry and she said, never in my life have I heard a man say, I'm sorry about what happened to you. Now, that acknowledgement is not the end of the healing journey, but it's a significant step on its road. So. I have found all around the world that, that people offered a, a key first step on the journey of healing is the importance of acknowledgement. But I want to link for a second, if I may, acknowledgement with knowledge. Because when you went to Auschwitz, you got emotional and spiritual knowledge and not simply intellectual knowledge. So we can read the books. So the kids in school can learn about what happened in 1948, the catastrophe for, for Palestinian, the, 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 the beginning of the Israeli state, as head knowledge. But it's this emotional and spiritual knowledge which is uh, equally important. Some of us believe the United States of America can, can never fully heal until this full acknowledgement of what happened to First Nations, what happened under slavery. But that acknowledgement has to be linked to a knowledge of the pain, to the hearing of the pain. Thank you. Um, to shift the, the conversation a little bit, uh, one of the challenges we have here in, in peace work is, is the question of how do we include others in the conversation? How do we include those who refuse to be or who we have marginalized from the equation itself, from the conversation and from engaging in, in the healing work. Um, for example, uh, if you look around this room, I would probably say that the great, great majority of Israelis would represent themselves as being uh, part of either the political left or the activist left of the community. Uh, on the Palestinian side, you would find 
those who are more on the secular, progressive, peace work uh, engagement. Um, I know one person, uh, Hannah Schlesinger, who is a friend, he is a settler. And the moment you say to many of my Jewish Israeli left, we are beginning to have a dialogue and engaging in this work with settlers, they begin to rebuke me <laughs> as a Palestinian for how dare you even talk with people like Hanan and others and even try to engage in the narrative and to understand and to learn the story of the other. Um, a second part link with this is, as I said, more of the secular progressive is the role of religion. Uh, those who are religious were marginalized, have always been marginalized. I think the Oslo peace process was a process that said religion is the problem, take religion out of the equation, and we will be able to, as secular leaders, resolve this conflict in a secular way, using Western negotiation styles, and, and just about reaching the agreement, the political agreement. And so my question for you, in, in the experience that you have had with the healing of memories in South Africa, how have you, have you been able to engage with those who are seen as the most violent, as the most marginalized, and what is the reaction of the community, sometimes their own community, towards them and the other towards them? Let, let me uh, begin by, uh, you know, I went to the, uh, what you call the Holocaust Museum. Uh, and while we were walking around, I saw a 16-year-old boy, about 16, and he, he was wearing a t-shirt. And the t-shirt had the um, uh, Christian symbol, Muslim symbol, Jewish symbol on it. And underneath it said coexistence. So I went across to him. I said, I think it's wonderful that you are wearing that uh, t-shirt. I just, like, congratulations. <laughs> I, you know, because um, for, me, for me that was a sign of hope. But then I said to the kid, well, you know, do you meet with your uh, Palestinian sisters and brothers? And he said, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> and I thought, what a tragedy. He's got the, I mean, he's got the t-shirt. But the kid has no experience of an encounter with 16-year-old kids who are, who, 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 who are Muslim or Christian or Palestinian or... Uh, and so one of the one of the sad things for me is that I'm being told here that there are almost decreasing places of engagement. Uh, you see, it, 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 and I know it's very sensitive to talk about the comparisons with apartheid. Often that helps put the temperature up in the room. Um, but but there is a reality of of. of comparison and, and it's in the separation that you can keep the hatred alive you can keep the stereotypes you can you can you can develop them and it's only in the encounter that you that can begin to shape but but also I don't want to be um, uh, give you a false rosy rosy rose colored spectacles about South Africa as an institute started in 1998. We struggle to get white people today to participate in our programs. Um, and there are, there are all kinds of uh, complicated uh, reasons for that. But, but one of the elements, uh, and, and in our context, and this is been, I see this around the world as well, uh, where people who have been, in an objective sense, the perpetrators, therefore have to deal with guilt and shame. And so who wants to deal with guilt and shame? So you go into denial. Yeah. And you go into, into silence. Mm -hmm. um, so the challenges, I think, and I think we've got to find, uh, and I think God gave us creativity, we've got to find creative ways you know, of those encounters. Uh, and, and I think uh, it's interesting uh, in our context, there will be some artists who bring black and white together. Yeah. And of course, 
We did to do, we have that other religion as well called football. Like I said, rugby. The, uh, although even there, there's a rugby and a soccer, but the World Cup in South yeah. Africa um, brought, uh, helped bring our nation together. So sometimes one's got to look at, I mean, the role of sport uh, as a tool for reconciliation. Um, but I think also, in our context, for hundreds of years, black people only saw things get worse. But they dared to have a hope. No? And I think, uh, I think we're in a dark time in the human family. Um, but will, will history say there were those who heard another drum, who believed that we could live together, who, who we struggled for justice, but as fellow human beings? Um, who, who accepted the, the Jewishness, accepted the Palestinian uh, uh, identity, but believed that there was a deeper identity and, and, and were willing to work and struggle for it. Will, will history say there were some who dared to, because you will be uh, dismissed, and, and sometimes those who work in this way will be dismissed by, by all sides as well. Um, but. but uh, and I think, I, you know, I like what my, my brother said who spoke before, because, um, uh, you know, what kind of society do we want our grandchildren to be brought up? Do we want our grandchildren to kill each other? Well, then we'll act in a certain way. If we want our grandchildren to play together, then we will act in a certain way towards, towards that reality. Several, several uh, directions we could we could go in now. Um, you talk about playing football together, um, and you also earlier talked about dialogue and and it, it not being enough that, that we need to uh, we need to act and not only talk. I think one of the problems here is that. Dialogue can, can sometimes be a way of maintaining the status quo. Uh, and, and particularly the, uh, the more powerful side sees that you know, participating in dialogue is doing their bit. They, they come to the dialogue and they've, you know, that's their contribution to trying to make things uh, better. And they go away feeling good about themselves because they're, now they're participating in dialogue, but they don't do anything to challenge the status quo. And to a certain extent, football here can work the same way. You can get kids playing football with each other, but if they never talk about the conflict and if they never challenge the reality where at the end of the football game they're going home to very different realities, you know, does that help challenge the status quo? On the other hand, when we're in a situation where there is so much enforced separation and we never come across each other at all, surely some contact is better than none. Surely it's better for our children to grow up meeting each other, knowing each other, um, than, than nothing. You know, so if, if football is the only... It, I don't know. I wrestle with these problems a lot, and I, I uh, yet again, I've got the question, and I'm asked, turning to you for an answer. Are you the devil's advocate? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, th I think, um, uh, of course, there can be tokenism, there can be, uh, I, I think, um, the academic community uh, sometimes uh, lets itself off of the hall. They said, we, we, we wrote the articles about it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not saying that the intellectual community, academic community has not got a role to play in writing the articles. But they have a, they have a role as citizens as well that go beyond that. You know, to, so, so, so I think it, it is uh, insufficient. And I think, uh, and it's like in a sense, as we, uh, you know, but it's just the politicians. They are the problem. We're fine. But we, you know, could I have another gin and tonic? You know? uh, and, and, and I, so I think there is uh, always uh, a challenge to act. Yes, we need to act within the environment of who we are, but there are always you know, more things to be done. You know, when we uh, set up this trauma center for victims of violence and torture, 
um, all the psychologists came out of the woodwork um, and the therapists and they said, well, you know, we, we are offering our services uh, to, to uh, victims of, of torture. And many of the victims <coughs> said, before we start this therapeutic session, where were you? Yeah. Where were you? you know, when the chips were down? Uh, and, and, and interesting, there was a woman who came to me one day and, and she had a, a story of trauma. And I listened to part of the story and then I said, well, I'll refer to you, I'll refer you to one of our uh, psychologists or psychiatrists. Um, and, and she said, uh, no. And I said, well, why, why, why not? Uh, she said, well, firstly, I've talked to them. Um, and I said, well, why are you coming to me? And she said, because you know pain and suffering and sacrifice. And that was more important for her than the, the technical skills. Uh, you know, I don't know, when, uh, I'm not a Muslim, I'm not Jewish, but in my tradition, there's a day of judgment. Um, and I, I have a feeling that God may not say to each of us, well, did you sort out this Palestinian uh, Israeli conflict? Is there now peace with justice for all? Uh, in uh, Where is it a two state or one state or one and a half state? Uh, but God might say, my dear, did you make your contribution? You know, did you, were, were you willing, uh, even when it cost you something, to say, no, this is wrong. Were, were, were you willing to say that um, life in the refugee camp in the, in the heart of Jerusalem is inexcusable? No? Were you, did, you, did you say anything about it? Uh, the services for, for Palestinian people uh, here in the heart of Jerusalem are not provided? Did you say anything about it? Did you do anything? No? So I think the challenge, I mean, uh, who was that person who said... Uh, what does God require of you? <laughs> with your God, at least with at least two faiths have got that in common. You know? Doing justice, loving mercy. Because I think what I love about that 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 verse, Micah, is it Micah? Micah. Uh, is that justice is connected to mercy, which for me speaks to compassion you know? and to a relationship with God. So so it, it has it all. They're working for justice, but not, not a cold working for justice, a justice motivated by, by compassion um, and the spiritual. But if I could just for a moment, I want to bring one other element into the conversation. Um, who's heard of PTSD? Please put up your hand. Post-traumatic stress disorder. Okay? Who of you has heard of Moral and spiritual injury. Put up your hand. Okay? Far fewer. Far fewer. So we know about uh, the psychological effects of trauma. And, and you don't have to be a rocket scientist to say, in this part of the world, everybody is a traumatized community. Everybody has their trauma. And I'm sure a huge number of people ha have suffer from PTSD, but we don't, uh, 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 and, but you've had armed conflict here, and you still have it in some, to some degree. And if you have that, it means you're going to have moral and spiritual injury, because, you know, we, we, we all have in us uh, a conscience, a sense of, 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 of right and wrong. But what we do is, we say to people when they're a certain age, they say, we'll put a uniform on you, and you can kill other people, and it's not murder. Huh? But why is it that old soldiers cry themselves to sleep? Huh? Because in fact, they have transversed the moral order. But if it's as we believe as the three Abrahamic faiths, that there's something of the image of God in each of us. If I attack you, I'm not only attacking the divine in you, I'm attacking the divine in myself. So I want to suggest that there's a depth of moral and spiritual injury that speaks not just to the competence, but to the society 
who have justified it uh, and carry within us the injury. And there's no tablet that's going to, in the United States of America, more old soldiers uh, commit suicide than die in armed conflict. They kill themselves. And that's because of moral and spiritual injury. And this says, okay, all right, let's have a just political solution. But be very clear, there will be an intergenerational journey of healing, which will include PTSD, but will also include moral and spiritual injury. And moral and spiritual injury is not the preserve of any one community. All of us are affected by it. So I'll take in. Yeah. I want to dive more into the issue of being motivated by fear. Um, one thing that I mentioned in my opening statement, and I, I want your response to this from the context of South Africa and experience there, is how we see many activists that are ready to speak the word peace, but are afraid to speak the word justice. And I, and I wonder where that comes from. And also to see the motivation of, of what I refer to as the existential threat of both communities. Both Palestinians and Israelis have in their narrative, have in their experience, uh, this knowledge that exists today that our community, our society, our nation will cease to be if we don't do something about it. And many choose violence to maintain that nation and that identity. And many choose peace, but it's still motivated out of fear and preserving and maintaining my identity, my status, my privilege, if I reach an agreement with you. Let us sign a piece of paper, but the main aim of that piece of paper is for me to maintain my privilege, whatever that is. And in the context of South Africa, especially in the context of a great majority and a small minority when it comes to the racial divide, was that issue of existential threat and fear and rest, and how has or justice continues to play a role in this? How do, how do you bring justice in South Africa when economic apartheid still exists in South Africa? The, the rich are still the privileged. And how does that look into the context of, of this conflict as well? <coughs> um, we were fortunate in South Africa that we had a succession of leaders of the black community who were moral giants. And we could have got, we could have <coughs> won that struggle much earlier in the process of a bloodbath. No? Um, but but you, 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 you had a Mandela who not only understood the hopes of black people, but he understood the fears of white people. No? Uh, and, and, and so we need leadership that accepts and understands the humanity of the other and the equal right to dignity of the other. So I think, I mean, I think those, uh, I mean, <laughs> the fears are real. You know, and I understand the video, and I understand why Jewish people, out of that long two thousand year history, would come to the conclusion. Um, but when 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 I, uh, I I visit the refugee camp in, in the center of Jerusalem, and I see the conditions under which people live, I would say you are endangering. The, the, the safety, the security of the future of the Israeli state. No? You're creating extremism. So, so I think, so what I'm suggesting is that if we do not act for justice, we will 
actually endanger our future. Well, uh, but again, you you need you need a sense of 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 moral vision um, for for that to be able to happen. So if you act purely for your own tribe on the basis of your fear, the chances are that in fact you are guaranteeing long-term conflict, long-term war, and that actually is endangering your security. Now, in the modern state, uh, I'm not naive to say, you know, you're not going to have police, you're not going to have armies, you're not going to have that. But unless you deal, uh, I mean, one stage uh, in the early years of South Africa, of, of the democratic state, um, uh, 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 intelligence agencies came up with a report because they were asked, tasked by the new government to say, what, are the great, what is the greatest security threat to the new democratic order? And they said, poverty and unemployment. Uh, this was the greatest, greatest threat. Now, uh, you, uh, if anyone's following South Africa closely, uh, we, we, are, we are in our own crisis um, at the moment. And part of it is a crisis of unethical leadership. Uh, but also, uh, we have become economically the most unequal society on earth. Um, then that doesn't spell peace. No? So, so, uh, so yes to our kind of work of, of dealing with the human heart, but that has to be linked to the, uh, the political, the social, and the economic. They are not, they're not alternatives. It's got to be, it's got to be both and. Um, and if we are not able to address it, our, our whole so-called miracle uh, is under threat. Yeah. You know? um, and and, and um, all we have achieved um, over those centuries uh, is in peril if we're not able to. So I think no matter how well we do now, it never guarantees tomorrow. And I think what I see in South Africa is... Uh, not just the role of fear, but the role of greed. Sure. Um, and I think uh, your own economic disparities are also a challenge to that, because that speaks not just to fear, but to greed. And unless we're able to deal with that, but I mean, there was this guy, these guys I read about, who are these recent writers? Was it Isaiah, Hosea, Micah, Amos? They had quite a lot to say about that. Yeah. And they saw precisely that relationship between worship and justice. You know, I hate your solemn assemblies because of what you're doing to the poor. So, uh, it, so our faith traditions have a great deal to say about that connection between our relationship with God, our worship, and justice. So maybe we should stop this meeting and just go and read Amos. That will help us quite a lot. <laughs> Amen.